Well, hello, Spring Lake. Good to be with you again. This is Nick. It is Friday, the 4th of September. It's so hard to believe that it's been six months now since we were last together, and I'm still hopeful that we'll uh, be reunited, uh, hopefully sooner rather than uh, later. Well, for this month of September, um, I have a new series, which I think all of you will enjoy. It's about four remarkable women, intrepid explorers in their own right. These women uh, buck convention at a time when only men were venturing out on dangerous explorations. Uh, these women, strong and fearless, divide, defied convention and social expectations to uh, travel the world and become trailblazers in their own right. Very interesting uh, women, although um, already in the early 19th century, so the early 1800s, um, many well-heeled women, privileged women, um, had made the grand tour to Europe, part of the uh, sort of obligatory for women uh, who were part of British high society to travel to Italy with family members, with brothers and sisters to visit Florence and explore the great monuments of the Italian Renaissance. From there, they would uh, venture down to Rome and uh, explore the monuments of ancient Rome, and then make their way um, across the Adriatic to Greece, visit um, the Parthenon and other monuments um, that were only beginning to be uh, excavated. The idea of venturing farther east to the Near East, so in particular the Levant or to Egypt, very few women ventured that far, except for those women who were either wives or family members of the East India Company or the French East India Company. So many of these female travelers would have seen uh, a lot of the monuments of the Near East. So they would have traveled to Istanbul, for example, uh, Constantinople, and at that time, quite a sophisticated urban center to visit um, the uh, Church of Hagia Sophia and the other famous mosques, um, et cetera, before they made their way to the official posts of their fathers or their husbands, um, et cetera. So we, they would have been part of the uh, entourage of administrators or uh, bureaucrats who had been assigned to various um, outlying posts, either part of the British Empire or the uh, French Empire. But today we're going to really focus on um, an amazing woman, this woman here uh, by the name of Lady Hester uh, Stanhope. And today's lecture uh, entitled Morning Star the Unconventional Life of Lady Hester uh, Stanhope, a passionate and intrepid traveler in an age when women were discouraged from being uh, adventurous. So Hester Lucy Stanhope was born in the year that the American colonies declared their independence from Great Britain. She was born in March of that year to uh, an aristocratic family. Um, her father was Charles Stanhope, the third Earl Stanhope, and her mother, after whom she was named, Lady uh, Hester Pitt. And notice Pitt, because her mother came from the distinguished Pitt family. Her uncle was none other than the British Prime Minister, uh, William Pitt the Younger. Now, Lucy uh, was the, she was 
usually um, called Lucy when she was young, uh, was the eldest of three daughters. Uh, from what we know from personal correspondence, um, her father Charles and her mom had a, a very close relationship, quite unusual among the aristocracy. It was, it was a real love match. And um, Lucy Hester would uh, have three daughters. And again, Hester Lucy was her eldest daughter. But tragically, the mother died after um, giving birth to her third daughter. But her father, Charles, uh, married within six months to a high society woman um, who went on to give birth to three sons. So Hester Lucy had three half brothers, but the mother, after um, the boys had sort of reached uh, their teenage years, sort of abandoned the family and retreated to her uh, town home in London, take up once again her uh, high society in London. So she left the, the uh, Stanhope estate um, located in Chevington in, in Kent. And um, as Lucy uh, would go on to say in her later years, if I passed her on the street, I wouldn't even know her. Now her father, Charles, was um, something of an eccentric. Um, he uh, liked to dabble in engineering um, and inventing all sorts of interesting um, contraptions. We know he was a great admirer of the uh, French revolution and he did everything he could to expunge all evidence of his aristocratic lineage. He liked to style himself citizen Stanhope. So in French, uh, citizen uh, citoyen, you know, the idea that you were a child of the enlightenment of the French Republic. And he renamed the family estate Democracy Hill. The father, who had originally had a pretty close relationship um, with Lucy, um, he became more and more um, difficult. And uh, she and her father had a very stormy relationship. Young Hester was a vivacious, beautiful, articulate young woman, but known for, for her acerbic wit. Um, she had a very acid tongue, and she always defied um, her father. So. She didn't want chaperones um, when she went to um, parties, etc. She just defied her father, and she got in trouble when she um, tried to get uh, one of her half half brothers. And she was very close with her siblings. Tried to spirit him out of the country with the help of her uncle um, William Pitt, the prime minister, to a college in um, Germany. This created a real rift between her and her father and also her defiance. And eventually he did disown her. She moved in with her uh, maternal um, grandmother. And in 1802, she made her first grand tour um, to the continent, again, visiting um, obligatory uh, sites in Italy um, and other parts of Europe before she had to um, return to England as a result, result of the uh, ongoing Napoleonic Wars. So this is the uh, Stanhope Ancestral Home Chevington, Chevington Castle, um, which is located in Kent. That's the uh, so-called Garden of England that is located uh, southeast of London. So um, after the death of her grandmother, her maternal grandmother, she went to live with her uncle, William Pitt. And in 1804, Pitt was reelected as prime minister. And she went to live with him at 10 Downing Street. And she very quickly became sort of the toast of the town within London high society. Pitt did not have a daughter and he loved uh, Lucy as his own, and um, she became effectively his hostess. She arranged um, important events for him um, in which she charmed um, 
many politicians and foreign dignitaries and very influential in establishing important political ties, um, et cetera. And um, again, she was um, very beloved. And, you know, I should have mentioned she was, um, she really stood out. She was very striking. She was nearly six feet tall with very white skin. So she stood above most men, the average height of a man at that time was probably five feet seven. Um, but then um, she had to uh, nurse her uncle when he uh, fell ill and she took care of him at the uh, Pitt uh, estate in Kent, uh, Walmer uh, Castle. Pitt eventually uh, would die um, in 1802. Now you'll recall that her father had disowned her she had a very small amount of money coming to her. Her uncle, of course, had, take, had taken care of all her needs for the last two and a half, three years. Uh, but now, um, you know, she had no income. However, her uncle did manage to provide her through an act of parliament, a generous stipend of about 1,200 pounds per year, not only uh, Lucy, but her sisters as well. So he made it a point to provide for them. And she went to live in um, a place called Montague Place in a small house. She had a couple of servants, but 1,200 pounds a year in Regency England. Again, this is um, the period of Jane Austen when there was a lot of uh, ostentation of wealth among uh, the English aristocracy. 1,200 pounds a year wasn't too much um, to live on, live on at that time. Now, um, she was very popular with men um, and she kind of openly displayed affection uh, with other men, including uh, Lord Granville uh, Gower, one of her first loves who was a politician um, but Gower had a number of dalliances. Um, he was already um, supposedly uh, engaged to another woman, uh, but that fell through. But that, nothing happened um, after he jilted her in 1806. But then she met um, another aristocrat uh, by the name of William Noel Hill. They were engaged, but then disengaged. And then she met uh, a man by the name of Sir John Moore, who was uh, a friend of her brother, um, Charles. Um, and both of them were serving in the Spanish campaigns during uh, the Napoleonic Wars. John Moore should really, truly have uh, fallen in love with. Um, she truly thought this would be the man whom she would marry and begin a life with. But uh, tragically, um, he died, as did her brother during um, the Spanish um, campaign. So again, um, both Charles, who was her favorite half-brother, and uh, Sir John Moore perished in 18. 09 in the Spanish engagement at Karuna. So Lucy was really grief stricken, having lost her uncle uh, William Pitt in 1806, um, the death of her brother uh, in 1808, um, and then uh, in 1809, the death of Moore. Also, as I mentioned, um, she had uh, financial difficulties. Again, 1,200 pounds was really not a, a, enough to live well in London. She couldn't even afford a coach or a footman. However, that stipend would go really far if she lived abroad. So she decided um, that she would uh, leave London, um, which she did. And she said goodbye to England, uh, in 1810 at the um, age of 33, and she would never, ever again um, return to England. 
Another real reason why um, she decided to quit her native country was born in part to her absolute disgust with what she regarded as the um, hypocrisies and corruption of her own social class. And as I mentioned, um, financial necessity too. Lucy was um, accompanied by her newly engaged physician. She had put an ad in the newspaper. She knew she needed a, a physician. So uh, Charles Marion uh, was uh, employed by her and he would um, remain a loyal friend um, throughout her many uh, adventures. And she also had a, um, a companion by uh, the name of uh, Miss Williams who would be very loyal to her uh, until uh, Miss Williams uh, passed away. So um, Lucy and her companions um, first made their way to Gibraltar, um, the British colony at the entrance um, to uh, the Mediterranean. And then they were um, off to Malta. But while in Gibraltar, she met a rich young Englishman by the name of Michael Bruce, who she later acknowledged was the love of her life. Now, Michael was about 12 years uh, younger than um, Hester, as she was called now by most of the people who met her. Uh, and on the island of Malta, again, that had a, a very large uh, British contingent, uh, many British officials, um, Malta was a British possession at the time, they began a, a kind of sordid love affair that really scandalized the small British community living on the island of uh, Malta, but she didn't really care at all. Now, I should mention, you know, for him to have undertaken this uh, love affair, he actually had to get permission from his aristocratic uh, father, who never um, supported the love affair. Um, Hester actually wrote a letter to the father saying, hey, guess what? Um, we're going to have this love affair if you'd like it or not. I will never give up an opportunity, he wrote to her, to the father of Michael, to those fair ladies who have married for a title, a house, and diamonds, having previously made up their minds to be faithful, faithless wives, to steer at me. That's what she um, wrote uh, to uh, Michael's father. From Malta, Stanhope's party sailed into Ottoman territory that included Greece, which was still under Ottoman control. This a few years before um, the Greek War of Independence. Um, first, they made their way to Corinth um, in late 1810, where the party grew to nine, and then on to Athens, where she met the uh, celebrated poet, um, Lord Byron, who would eventually join uh, the Greeks in the War of Independence against the uh, Ottoman Turks, dying in uh, Messalonghi. Um, he was, of course, part of a romantic cult. He was sort of this iconographic uh, figure. Supposedly, um, when Byron first met uh, Hester Lucy, um, he jumped into the Aegean Sea. Um, we know he liked to um, bathe himself in the Aegean, especially near the promontory of Mount Su Sunian. But the two of them did not like one another at all. They were two formidable individuals with acerbic wits. Um, he described her as that dangerous female wit, that she thing. Now, it was reported that Lord Byron um, did originally want to join uh, Hester's expedition, but that never really came um, to fruition. They did communicate over the years, but as I mentioned, they didn't have um, a, a very great relationship. So here's a map uh, showing the voice. So here, Malta. So they would have left uh, the capital of Malta, uh, Valletta, and then they would have entered into the Corinthian Gulf, made their way to Corinth, and then onward to Athens. Um, and then from there, they're now going to make their way 
to the great city of uh, Constantinople. So the party finally made its way um, to Constantinople, um, present day Istanbul, uh, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, the so-called um, sublime port. Oops something happened here. In any case, you just saw me there for a second. Uh, in any case, um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, this was this great urbane cosmopolitan city. There were quite a few um, European colonies, including a sizable um, exp expatriate British colony. But she really desired to make her visit to Constantinople at this time because it was the Ottoman Empire was coming under the French sphere of influence. She even wrote a letter to George III while she was in Malta in July of 1810, saying uh, in that letter that she wanted to reach uh, Constantinople before the destruction of the Turkish Empire as well. And I believe that really is near at hand. So um, as a visitor, um, she visited some of the great monuments. Now, I should mention um, that en route to uh, Constantinople, she had begun to uh, change, uh, she had begun to change her outfit and adapting a lot of Mideastern garb. And eventually she'll become, for, as it were, a true woman of the Middle East in her outward presentation. But she already, uh, while in Constantinople, is beginning to wear um, the garb of Ottoman dress. She has to hide herself, the fact that she's a female, she has to hide her sex um, and appear as a man so she could secretly make her way into mosques and other forbidden sites like the harem, etc. We know that she rode unveiled on horseback through the uh, streets of Constantinople at one point right past the Ottoman Sultan. And people were at once um, absolutely, this was scandalous to see a Christian woman um, unveiled and riding on horseback but a lot of people were bemused um, by her audacity. Uh, and she really sort of made a name for herself already. Lucy was really something of an eccentric, and you might say she had uh, sort of delusions of grandeur. She kind of uh, got involved in some political intrigue or would be intrigue, um, so she tried to obtain information from important uh, Ottoman personages, including the commander of the Turkish fleet, Captain Pasha or Hafiz Ali, to try to obtain information. Um, again, in order to board the ship, um, she had to uh, dress um, as a man. And again, this is how she was able to visit uh, many of the famous sites uh, in and around Constantinople, like the famous um, Hagia Sophia, which, as you know, a few months ago was reverted back into a mosque by uh, Erdogan, um, sadly, uh, very controversial, as you know. And she would travel in the countryside dressed as a, as a man. But she came up with sort of a, a scatterbrained idea, if you will, that uh, she, if she won the favor of the French ambassador at the court of Topkapi in Constantinople, she might be able to get a French passport that would allow her to make her way to Paris via Hungary and Germany. And then she might have an audience with none other than Napoleon Bonaparte. And she believed that she had the womanly, the womanly uh, guile and uh, tact and through her women, womanly ways would be able to gain the confidence of Napoleon himself. And then she could 
obtain secrets from him, sort of psychoanalyze him. Maybe he might divulge to her um, some of his uh, military strategy, etc. And then she would make her way back to England and provide this um, information. Well, the uh, British officials in Constantinople caught wind of this and they said, no way. And um, they uh, pretty much um, uh, prevented her from moving forward. Um, her, her plan was, uh, you know, discovered and it never happened. So as a result of this failure, she decided she and her entourage would now make their way to uh, Cairo. And notice here how she already is beginning to adapt sort of this oriental dress. Here's one of the um, harem baths um, in Constantinople. This is a 19th century um, tinted engraving of Hagia Sophia, which um, of course at the time she was visiting Constantinople was a mosque um, during the Ottoman Empire. Of course, in the uh, around 1923, Ataturk had converted it into a museum. And of course, Hagia Sophia became a world heritage site. But as I just mentioned, uh, the very controversial decision by Erdogan to convert it back into a mosque. And very recently, he also converted the Kariye or Hora church back again into a mosque. So we'll be hearing more about that, I'm sure, in the not too distant future. So now Hester and her party make their way to Egypt and en route, um, they become shipwrecked on the island of Rhodes, um, the same island where St. Paul was uh, shipwrecked uh, some 18 centuries earlier. And they lost uh, most of their belongings, including her European clothing. And at this point, um, she decides that she's going to become fully Oriental, as it were, you know, the term Orientalism to describe the European term to describe um, adapting the Middle Eastern uh, way of life. So she uh, wears Turkish clothing. Um, she refuses to wear a veil. Instead, she wears a turban, uh, pantaloons, which you can see here, um, elaborate um, waistcoats, waistcoats, um, and that are cinched at the weights, uh, scimitars, etc. Eventually, she's going to uh, purchase a very ornate Albanian dagger. So, for all the world now, she's. Um, really adapting the uh, image of sort of this warrior princess. And many weren't sure because of her height if she was male or female. A lot of times people were unsure. She saw herself as a Mameluk. Uh, those are the slave soldiers who had uh, ruled out of uh, Cairo. And um, this, uh, you know, she saw herself even as some kind of Muslim princess, again, sort of these delusions of uh, grandeur, and she kind of fashioned herself as sort of this, uh, with this sort of mystical aura about her. So in February of 1812, they um, did arrive in the great city of Alexandria, and the party began to uh, take up Arabic um, and Turkish to become proficient. Um, in those languages. Uh, and, you know, she just was sort of caught up, like so many Europeans were, and some women were, and just the, the mystery, the intrigue. This world really fascinated, enchanted uh, Europeans as a, a place at once of, of exotic uh, atmosphere, but dangerous. Um, and fanatic um, at the same time. Now, um, as would uh, be her custom, she would make it a point to have an audience with a local leader. And in this case, she was able to obtain an audience with Muhammad um, Ali, um, who was 
the uh, ruler of Egypt um, at that time. And um, he was very fascinated by this uh, enchanting woman. She and her party had uh, taken up residence in the Nile Delta, but it was very humid. Um, it's just uh, filled with uh, flies and fleas. And so she and her uh, party decided that they would make their way um, to the Levant, the Near, the Near East, so uh, Syria and, and the Lebanon. She was um, very adept at um, establishing relationships uh, with local rulers. And from Muhammad Ali, she and her party were given um, a special passport, a firman that would allow them to continue to travel um, in the heart of the uh, Ottoman Empire. So she was able to make her way to um, the Near East and eventually to the Syrian desert, becoming one of the uh, first Europeans um, to make uh, their way to uh, Syria at this time. And um, the first port was that at Jaffa, or Jaffa, which is that ancient uh, settlement today is just uh, south of uh, Tel Aviv. Um, but here she had to um, make arrangements with uh, one of the local uh, clan members um, by the name of Sheikh Abu Ghosh. Um, and she met him at his camp, the purpose of which was to obtain um, safe passage to Jerusalem and to uh, many of the other sites of the Holy Land, like uh, Nazareth and Acre. So again, she used her women, her womanly guile, and her all her charm, and a lot of bribery. He, she paid him quite a bit of money so she and her party could have safe passage through um, the Holy Land. The local tribes were um, really uh, just. Uh, awestruck by the sight of this tall statuesque woman with um, very white, almost porcelain colored skin, riding astride on an Arabian stallion uh, with her caravan, with her turban, um, with her dagger, with her pantaloons. And, um, you know, that journey from the coast of Jaffa inland was, like I said, very dangerous. I mean, you could be um, stopped by highway, highwaymen and abandoned who would want whatever um, money or personal effects that you had. But again, um, the sheikh had uh, made certain that she had a uh, safe passage. And in uh, Jerusalem, she would, of course, visit uh, the famous Christian sites, um, the Via Dolorosa, and of course, the famous uh, Church of the uh, Holy Sepulchre. More than anything else, um, she wanted to see the uh, great city of Damascus. Um, in 1812, um, few Europeans were allowed to visit this very ancient, holy Islamic city, of course, the capital of the first great um, caliphate of the uh, Umayyads in the uh, 7th century in the site of the great mosque. And um, the idea of a woman entering the holy city was considered really forbidden um, and anathema. She had been warned in a letter um, by the Pasha of Damascus, who had given her an invitation that she had to and wear a veil when entering this very holy city or risk facing uh, an angry mob. So instead she violated um, his warning, um, first as a Christian, secondly as a woman and riding horseback. Uh, without her face covered. So you can imagine, I mean, she could have been um, attacked uh, by a mob. But again, um, interestingly enough, the, the mob was at once angry, but then um, awestruck, and then 
dumbfounded to see a, a woman like this riding through the streets, seemingly unafraid, sort of carrying herself as though she were a deity or a goddess or some kind of princess, uh, a Middle Eastern princess um, who suddenly made her appearance and in an act of, of in an act that sort of recognized that she was something special or divine, the people spread coffee. And that's something that you did as a sign of respect to somebody of great personage. These are a couple of uh, 19th century um, engravings. The one on the left shows the exterior of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem and then um, the interior with the idiculum where um, Jesus is purportedly buried, at least in the Catholic and, East, and Eastern Orthodox um, tradition, this idiculum was recently uh, restored. Um, of all the places in the Middle East, or I should say the Near East, that Hester wanted to visit, none was um, more legendary than the great city of uh, Palmyra, once the home of uh, Queen Zenobia, a famous uh, princess who defied the hegemony of the Roman Empire when she established her own kingdom in this uh, famous uh, palm city. Palmyra uh, in the second half of the uh, third century. She wanted to become the first European woman to visit the site when she wrote, if I had been a man, my, excuse me, if I had been a man, my love for fame would have been unbounded. But a journey to this vain sisty would come at a cost. And again, um, she had um, already mounted a number of debts. Um, she was still being funded by Bruce, but that would dry up in a few years. But she had to bribe a lot of locals, Bedouin um, traders and locals to, who were armed, who would escort um, the party to um, the great uh, caravan city of Palmyra. And again, um, she was able through her cunning and through her charm and allure, she absolutely bewitched um, the chief of the Hassana tribe, a local Bedouin tribe, Muhanna Al-Fadil. And in March of 1813, <coughs> with a retinue of nearly a hundred Bedouins who were all decked out with um, plumed lances and ostrich feathers. She made her way in procession to this great city in the desert, again, um, the home of Queen Zenobia. And she kind of saw herself as the reincarnation of Queen Zenobia, again, these sort of delusions of grandeur. Um, again, you see this in her letters that she wrote back. She really kind of saw herself as this sort of mystical ancient queen. Um, in any case, this was the zenith of her sort of otherwise lackluster career, if you will. Um, but in any case, this was her crowning moment. A great festival was held in her honor and women and men uh, celebrated her as the bright morning star. She herself um, said, I have been crowned queen of the desert. I have nothing to fear. I am the sun and I am the stars, the pearl, the lion, the light of heaven. And um, the procession ended under the Great Arch of Triumph at Palmyra. This was um, one of the 
most famous, if not the iconic site at Palmyra, of course, a World Heritage site, but tragically, the world beheld the destruction of this monument as well as other famed monuments at Palmyra at the hands of ISIS back in uh, 2015. Um, here's a this is more modern day map, but here shows uh, present day uh, Syria. Here's uh, the capital of uh, Damascus. Here's Acre down here. And then here's the um, legendary uh, city of Palmyra. Sadly, of course, um, so much of it destroyed by uh, ISIS just five years ago. This is um, a beautiful uh, black and white photograph showing um, a Bedouin woman um, walking through one of the alleys of the uh, city of Palmyra. You can see, I think this is the Temple of Baal in the distance. And then this is uh, a painting of Queen Zenobia herself overlooking her kingdom of Palmyra. Now, Hester was also something of a pioneer archaeologist. Um, she would establish one of the first truly scientific archaeological excavations um, in Palestine. And it happened in 1815 when somehow she came into possession of an Italian manuscript that um, purported that Somewhere in the Levant, um, it turned out it was in the city of Ashkelon on the, Ga on the Gaza Strip, just north of Gaza, that a fabulous treasure would be found there under the ruins of a mosque in the city of uh, Ashkelon. Here's um, a David Roberts uh, engraving of the city in the distance. So she was given... Um, permission by Ottoman authorities to excavate there, but um, she was accompanied by none other than the governor of the port city of Jaffa. Um, she never unearthed a cache of gold coins. Um, that was a dead end, but she did discover some artifacts in Ashkelon dating back to the late Roman period including a seven foot marble statue, which she smashed and threw into the sea. Now she did this in order to show the authorities who had accompanied her that like so many Europeans who were looting many um, sites in the Middle East and in the Near East, that she had no intention, she and her party, of keeping any treasures and bringing them back. Of course, um, Lord Elgin's um, infamous uh, plunder of the Parthenon sculptures um, was in the mind of, of many of these local leaders. But she did this to show she had, she had no intention of stealing artifacts and bringing them uh, back to Europe. She said these are treasures that belong in the country in which they were um, discovered. So as I mentioned earlier, um, her time in uh, Palmyra was kind of the high point of Hester's life, but then everything sort of went to hell in a handbasket. Um, her lover, uh, Michael Bruce, um, had already gone back um, to England when he got word that his father um, was dying. Um, and he had fallen in love with a, a woman and that got bought back to Hester. He had promised her that he would send her um, a generous stipend of about a thousand pounds because she knew she was in um, need of money, but um, that would never uh, materialize, that nice allowance that would supplement her pension um, but she had gone into heavy debt um, once she arrived in Syria. She moved into sort of a dilapidated monastery, which you see here on this hill, uh, the monastery of St. Uh, Elias. Uh, she stayed there for about seven years. 
before she made her way to another ruined monastery of Jun in the foothills of Mount Lebanon. Now, in this region, as you know, is the countryside in the Lebanon and parts of Syria of the famous Druze, the Druze of Lebanon. They're a very distinctive monotheistic uh, sect that have a very sort of eclectic religion that draws on uh, some Islamic faith, especially that of the Fatimids, on Judaic thoughts. So they kind of regard themselves as an Abrahamic religion uh, and also uh, Christian mysticism, um, uh, Greek philosophy, the philosophy of Plato, etc. And they were marginalized and persecuted uh, by the Muslim rulers um, in the area, but she protected them. And there were a lot of refugees, especially when civil wars erupted between the Muslims uh, and the Druze at the time. And she fed them during times of trouble. Um, and she really was sort of the first British individual who really sort of forged relationships with the local um, Druze population and the British population uh, and the Islamic population at that time, which would go a long way towards the formalization of political ties between uh, Britain and this region, although the French would eventually gain hegemony um, over the region. Sadly, she died alone and, in, and destitute. Um, she was heavily in debt. But at the time of her death in 1839, in uh, this last um, home, her little home in June, um, she still had 37 <laughs> servants to wait on her. Um, but she already had achieved sort of immortality as perhaps the most famous European woman to um, live and travel in this uh, region. Her um, body, which was discovered, um, had already decomposed um, when it was laid to rest um, in the garden. Um, in 2004, um, her ashes were scattered in her home in June. They had been, her, I should say that her remains had been disinterred and then were placed up until 2004 in the garden of the British ambassador uh, of Syria outside Damascus. Much of what we know about um, Lady Hester Stanhope comes by way of her letters, but most importantly, by the memoirs of the Lady Hester Stanhope published in 1845 by her lifelong friend, Dr. Charles Marion, who really gives a very glowing kind of hagiographic uh, treatment of her. Um, he does point out her eccentricities and her sort of delusions of grandeur, saying, well, she may have been sort of bordering um, on madness, but she's best known as this intrepid, fearless woman who um, established herself well um, in the Middle East, was able to forge ties with Bedouin tribesmen and chieftains, and uh, in so doing, um, give sort of uh, the locals uh, a more favorable opinion of these colonialists. Um, and as I mentioned, she really was at the forefront of forging ties between Great Britain um, and Lebanon, but she'll always be sort of a, as a remembered as this remarkable adventurous woman who lived in two worlds at once. So she was, uh, she began as this proper British uh, aristocrat from privileged society and ended her life as this Eastern European um, mystical woman uh, beloved uh, by many of the locals um, in Lebanon and in Syria. So um, next week, uh, we're going to explore the life of another remarkable uh, woman. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing you uh, all next week. So take care now.